Well, thank you for being with us this Shabbat this afternoon. It's great to see some new faces. I'm going to call our invited guest today to uh, come and join me here, Pastor Joseph John from Hyderabad, India. Please welcome him. He's coming back to us. Obviously, via uh, quite a few travels in the last month, Virginia, Texas, he's getting around. But uh, come Monday, coming back to his family back in India, that sorely misses you, and uh, we're very glad to have you back. Last time he was with us, it was about the October time frame, and we were in Suite 400. Yeah. And uh, he, he came and he told us, actually, he had never seen the prior place. He came to that place and he said, well, this place is too small. A week later, Rabbi Shapiro was here, and he said, well, this place is too small. <laughs> from two weeks, from Lech Lecha, uh, to Noah, I mean, he's part of Shah, the following day, the owner called us, do you want this place? And we were moving our synagogue, literally, 48 hours after they released that word, last word. Amen. And here we are today. So thank Amen. you. Thank you for coming back and visiting us. You have a special word for us today. Amen. Shabbat shalom. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. I just want to bring greetings to each of you in the name of Yeshua. And I want to bring greetings from our Kehila, Kehilat Bethlehem, and from the city of Hyderabad, India. We have a desire, we have a vision, we, have, we, we are expecting something great. But before that, Romans chapter... Uh, 8, verse 18, it says, Romans 8, 18 and 19, it says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation awaits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. In other words, the Bible is very clear in telling us that creation awaits the revealing of the sons of God. And I believe that in the season, God is calling men, you and I, to arise, to be sons of God, children of God. And as we arise and become children of God, creation is waiting to respond, to see what the sons of God are going to do in these last days. Friends, I want us to know that we are living in one of the greatest times in history. The world all over is beginning to see the fullness of the Gentiles coming in. Gentiles are beginning to open their eyes. God is opening the eyes of the Gentiles to see what is happening all over the world. And there is this great restoration that is taking place. And in this season, I believe that God is asking us to step up. It is a season to step up and to move forward. It is not a season to slack. It is not a season to give up. It is not a season to be in the back burner. It is a season to arise. It is a season to shine. It is a season to say, Lord, here am I. I'm willing to go before you. I'm willing to walk like Abraham walked. In the season, God is calling men and women who are saying, Who is willing to go before me and walk before me, says the Lord. Friends in India, we have a dream. Thomas the Apostle came centuries, centuries ago in our nation. He came to India with one vision. One vision only to restore his own brethren to the, to the Messiah. To tell them that the Messiah has arrived and to be restored. He was martyred in our country. Years later, we feel that God has called us as a community. Transformed from a local church to a full messianic congregation. To say, Lord, here we are. Taking up the mantle of Thomas. And say, Lord, here we are available. We want to see this nation being restored. This nation has been kind to the Jewish people from years old. It is time for the churches and the Christians and the believers of the land to arise and to see the fullness of the Lord. In this season, I pray that you would join with me. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, as I came this time, I had this sense of sadness for the, for the first two days. And I was wondering, what is happening? 
Why is there so much of sadness in my heart? And yesterday evening when I came here, actually, the Lord put a word in my heart. It was from Psalms chapter 30, verse 7. He has turned my mourning into dancing. It's not Psalms 30. It's anyway, the word was that he has turned my mourning into dancing. I believe this evening the Lord wants to tell us. He's about to turn your mourning into dancing. This year is going to be a year of restoration. Tom and Miriam, I believe that this year, David and Ori, I want you also to know, this year, the Lord is going to turn things around. It's not going to be like the years before. This is a season of restoration, for Hashem says that He will turn your mourning into dancing. And in the season, God is saying, do not give up, but it is a time to move forward. Isaiah 46 verse 10 says, God said that he will declare the end from the beginning. It says, Magid Merashid Akarid. God says, I foretell the beginning. I will tell the end. In other words, he uses the Hebrew uses the word Magid, meaning I preach from the beginning what the end is going to be. The Hebrew word for moving forward is the Hebrew word Kadima. The word Kadima is related to another Hebrew word meaning Kedem. Kedem means before, as in related to something that existed before. For example, Micah says that the Messiah, his origin is from before. His origin predates the world of this world. Messiah comes from an ancient time. He comes from eternity. And in order to go forward or in order to have something to come to pass, it must be rooted in something that is in ancient times. In other words, in order to move forward in our calling, the calling should have been pre-existed long time ago, before the foundations of the world. It goes on to say in Isaiah 46 verse 10 that, that he declares the end from the beginning and then it says, From ancient times, nothing is made unless my, may, my word makes it rise. The Hebrew word for rise over there is takum, which, it, which is related to another word, tekiyat, which means resurrection of the word, dead. In other words, the Bible is saying, Unless my word allows it to resurrect from the grave, nothing is going to come to pass. In the season, God is saying that I am going to cause my word which has gone forth to come to pass and it will. Yeah. It will resurrect. In other words, that which we think has been dead, that which we think has been hopeless, that which we think has been useless, that which we think that has no hope, God says in the season, I am restoring it back. If you look in this week's Torah portion, we see the beginning of Abraham's calling is actually revealed in the end of his calling. In other words, the Torah tells us in order for Abraham to reach the climax of his calling, the apex of his calling, for why God has brought him into this world, his mission, his mandate, he had to undergo trials and tribulations. We see there are about 10 trials and tribulations he's, we see. Abraham's most difficult and final test was called forth in the beginning and in the beginning it was revealed whether he would endure till the end which is a very interesting paradox for example why is it why is it important to highlight that in order for abraham to fulfill his calling in god he had to undergo his testing think with me for example testing none of us like testing we don't want to go through tests especially students we don't want to go through tests in the exams university schools we hate it why because 
to go through a test, I have to sacrifice certain things. I have to study. None of us like to go through us. But still, the scripture says, our ability to enter the kingdom of God is not based on a prayer we say. It is not based on the donation or the zetka we give. It is not based on the miracles we perform. Believe it or not, it is not even based on the calling on the name of Yeshua. It is, it is, it is based on, 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 it is basically based on through the sufferings and the testings we go through. Where do we find this? Matthew chapter 7 verse 21 says it. Yeshua says, not everyone who calls upon my name, not everyone who uh, casts out demons, not everyone who does a miracle, or not even anybody who does have the gift of, uh, gift of prophecy will enter the kingdom of God. But what is the prerequisite to enter the kingdom of God? It says very clearly over there, not everyone who says to me, master, master, is going to enter into the kingdom of God. But listen, but everyone who does the will of the Father who is in heaven. So the question we need to ask ourselves, what is the will of the Father? We find the will of the Father in Acts chapter 14, verse 22, and Yeshua's disciples were saying, strengthening the souls of others who were being disciplined in the kingdom and encouraging them to remain in faith or in emunah and exhorting them that through great trials and tribulations, it is necessary to endure for us to enter into the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. In other words, trials and tribulations is a good thing. I know it's difficult, but it's a great thing. It is only through that we enter the kingdom of God is what Acts basically says. I know we are not excited about that. Very clearly, nobody enters the kingdom by just saying the sinner's prayer. Nobody enters the kingdom because you have been baptized in holy waters. Nobody, or, or through infant baptism, or through circumcision, or by casting demons, or by performing miracles, or by prophecy. Nobody enters in those terms. Instead, the way to enter the kingdom of God. Is through trials and tribulations. So in other words, when we go through a trial and tribulation, we should be glad because we are entering into the kingdom of God. Abraham had to endure a tribulation period of 10 trials. And in order for Abraham to have gone ahead, gone forward, he had to endure it from before. If we can't endure our trials that we have been called from before, then we are not able to move forward. Friends, we need to understand something. Our end, our calling, when I say that, it's not the end of our life. Our fulfillment of why we have been created is determined at the beginning. Our beginning will determine our end. This concept is brought down by Shaul in the book of Romans where he says that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord. It's a famous passage, but we need to understand the context. The reason why all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord. Why? Verse number 29 of Romans 8, Shaul says, why? That he has known them from before. He has known them from the ancient times. You know, we said the prayer, return us back to the times of old. That's what it means. And then the reason why he has known us from before is not because of the prayer we said or from the miracle we said. But Paul goes on to say that they, because they desired to be conformed to the image of the Messiah, his son. And those who were conformed to the image of Messiah, his son, they were conformed only for one reason, for that God has called them from ancient times. And the reason why they were conformed is because they have an ancient calling. In other words, some people desire to be conformed. They want to be like the Messiah. This desire does not come from man. It does not come from the enemy, but it comes from God. And that desire causes us to focus on God. Just like Abraham, people who have been called for the Messiah from time ago is able to go forward in their calling. Therefore, it is important to understand trials and tribulations is a good thing. Everybody with me? If we desire to move forward with our mission, in other words, our calling in God, 
We must endure trials and tribulations in this world. I'm not talking about the doctrine of uh, uh, rapture and all. That's not what I'm saying. The Torah tells us Abraham's end was revealed in his beginning. End meaning not the end of his life, rather his spiritual apex. The purpose of why Abraham came into this world, his calling. The question is, how was his end revealed in the beginning? Remember the last and final test of Abraham? The last and final test of Abraham was the Akedah, the, the, the binding of Isaac, where he brings up his son as an offering. Now the question is, how can the binding of Isaac be the end when the Torah does not mention the binding of Isaac in the beginning? The, you know what it is? It is mentioned in the beginning. It is sometimes in the English or in the Spanish it is not there, but it is there in the Hebrew. See what it says in Genesis 22 verse 2. Genesis 22 verse 2, God is speaking to Abraham. It says, Vayomer Kana. Please, it's not a it's not a command, but it is a it is it is it is it is it is a generous, nice word. Et binka, take your son. God, which son? Abraham had a couple of sons. Yet Yekida, the one unified son. Abraham is saying, I like to be unified with all of my children. God says, No, 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 Abraham, you don't understand. I share a half the son that you love. Father, I love all my sons. Hashem says, You still don't understand. At Itzak, Isaac. And this is what he tells him. Va lekleka el eretz hamoria. Take him from yourself to the land of Moriah, and I will show to you the mountain which you need to bring in. Do you remember what was Abraham's calling first? Abraham's calling is first found in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, where he says, Lek leka. Get out of yourself. Here in Genesis 22, again, he, he uses the same word, Lek leka. God tells Abraham in the beginning, lek leka, and God tells Abraham in the end, lek leka. Why? Because in the beginning, Abraham was willing to depart from everything that he had in the beginning. The question is, what did Abraham have? Abraham, his father was Terah. He was a rich man. He was a wealthy man. He was a master of astronomy, master of astrology. He was a financially secure man. He had a lot of friends, but he was willing to leave everything when God said, Lek, leka, get out of yourself from your homeland, from your people and everything. And because Abraham was willing to depart from everything he had in the beginning, it proved to God that he will be willing to depart from everything in the end. What was the everything that Abraham had in the end? It was Itzhak. Who was Itzhak? Itzhak was his promise. And the Torah tells us that between the end and of Abraham's calling and the beginning of Abraham's calling, it was not an easy journey. Between Lekleka in Genesis 12 and Lekleka in Genesis 22, it was a very, very difficult journey. Abraham had to endure some very, very difficult times. But he was not given a free pass to do whatever he wanted in this world. He had to endure. And he had to push forward and he had to continue moving in God. Let us think about this concept for a moment. Let's think and argue about Abraham. Just think that you are Abraham. You are hearing, you are, you are doing your stuff and one day you hear, Lek leka. Who talked to me? <laughs> Who is talking to me? Here again you are hearing, Lek leka. And but he recognizes that he, God is, some voice is telling him to get out. He leaves, he hears the voice of God. He leaves his home, he leaves his friends, he leaves his family. He tells his parents, he tells his father, he tells everybody. Everybody thinks he's mad, but he's listening to this voice. You know what? He still leaves. And now he comes to the border of the promised land. And as soon as he comes to the border of the promised land, what happens? There's a famine there. Instead of finding it a promised land, he finds a great famine. It's a great major famine. Abraham sees the famine and the Bible says, now the Torah says, now he heads down to Egypt. I thought I heard the voice of God. 
I thought God was speaking to me. Now it looks like a broken promise. Now we are starting to rationalize. We are starting to think, maybe, maybe I was deceived. Maybe uh, it's better for me to go back. He doesn't want to go back. If I return, my family and my friends are going to make fun of me. I mean, who in their right mind travels after hearing a voice in their head? Lek leka. You tell it to a psychiatrist today, he'll put you on medication. Don't tell him that. But the question is, who will do what Abraham did? You want to know? The Bible says it. The righteous shall live by faith. It is the righteous who goes by the voice that they hear the voice of God. And the Torah tells us that because Abraham had faith, he was considered righteous in the eyes of God. And because Abraham was determined from the beginning to persevere in his faith, he was not going to go back like a coward. No matter how many trials he went through, no matter how many tribulations, Abraham was willing, he was desi desired in his heart to kadima, to move forward in order to fulfill his calling which was called forth from the beginning see what it says in hebrews chapter 10 verses 32 through 39 shavuot brings up this concept where he reminds all the jewish believers in messiah to remember their calling in yeshua no matter how things look in the physical realm no matter how things is difficult it might feel that we want to we want to we don't we don't want to trust god anymore but shavuot is saying it is important that we move forward he says in 32 of hebrews 10 Please remember the days of old when you received the calling. You endured great trials and tribulations and great sufferings. Verse 33, he says, sometimes being publicly abused and insulted. Why were they abused? Because, because it is not right for Jews to believe in Jesus. So just he says, sometimes being publicly abused and insulted, humiliated, both sufferings, other times being oppressed with others who are like-minded like yourself. For Verse 34 says, for you show Gimelot Kassidim, great kindness for the brethren Messiah in the prisons with joy, where you accepted the things that came upon you, even with confiscation of the property, because you have intimate knowledge that you possess a better and a more enduring inheritance. In other words, you don't put your treasure in, 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 in you don't put your hope and in the treasures you have or in the education you have or in the jobs you have or in this world, you put your hope in the almighty God. And Shavuot goes on to say in verse 35, but do not discard your confident trust. The word trust over there in Hebrew is the word bitter corn, which means that, that, that no matter what, I trust God. And God, Shavuot says, because you trust God unconditionally, there is great reward. Pastor, Pastor Tom says, I will come at 10 o'clock. Even if he's a little delayed, I will still wait. Why? Because I believe, I trust in Pastor Storm. It's that kind of faith. Verse 36 says, You are needy of the kind of patience that has endurance in order that having accomplished the will of God, you will receive the promise. Friends, once again, I want us to know, it is through trials and tribulations we enter the kingdom of God. Verse 37 says, Yet a little while, and Messiah will come and not delay. And he basically is quoting verse 38 from Habakkuk. He says, because why? The righteous live by faith. And if he shrinks back, he's a defactor. God does not take any delight in such a person who was a com co coward. In other words, you know what Shaul is saying? Shaul is saying, let me get this straight. You know what? We are not cowards. In verse 39, he says, but we are not of those who shrink back as defectors towards some type of destruction, but we are those with faith, with emunah, whose soul is preserved in the salvation of God. Friends, there are times when we walk with God and times when we walk in our calling, it appears that we might be making a big mistake like Abraham. The enemy comes through families. The enemy comes through friends, co-workers, people who are looking at your every move to get you to abandon your calling or your walk with God. Abraham did not have any clue that there was a famine in the promised land. But he was determined to endure the insults of any of his family members of, and family members and friends about hearing the voice of God when God told him to let let go. 
had God has had God told Abraham there was a famine in the land, you know what? Most probably Abraham would not have gone there. It's it's like us, you know. God knows if He informs you and I every every detail of our journey. We have this tendency of changing our travel plans. Let's book our ticket six months from now. There is a famine in the land. God knows the human nature. What is human nature? Human nature lacks faith. We are enticed by physical things. To us, seeing is believing. And in order to get us respond to our calling, He has to sometimes withhold certain information. And the Torah tells us that after Abraham knew the famine, he was there, he decided to go south. And the scripture says that he went down to Egypt. During those days, Egypt was the most corrupt place in the known world of that time. Now it's interesting. Just as God did not inform Abraham about the famine, he didn't even tell Abraham about going to Egypt. God was silent during this whole thing. He's testing him, friends. Imagine the doubts going through Abraham's head. Maybe I was listening to the deceiving spirits. Imagine after telling my family and friends, instead of going back to his home country, he's going to Egypt. In Genesis 12:11, it says in the Hebrew, "He craved la la lavo mitzrayma. He drew near to Egypt." The word "hikriv" comes from the Hebrew word "karav," which means to be drawn. In other words. It might think that Abraham's going to Egypt physically was a wrong decision. But his going through Egypt was also the hand of God. For what? To draw him close to God. You know, when we go through difficult times, we think, why are we going through difficult times? In other words, the Bible is saying, our difficult times is to draw us close to Him so that we might enter the kingdom of God. He does this in order to test our faith. He uses these things as a bait to draw us close to God. And this is what the, what the Torah is saying about Abraham. That there's a powerful lesson we can learn from this. Like Abraham, some of us desire to seek God with a pure heart. We desire to seek God with a pure motive. We desire to seek God with a pure desire. And God permits situations to happen in our lives that appear to be big, big mistakes. We sometimes even regret them. He uses these situations that appear to be a mistake in order to test us for what? So that He can draw us near to Him. The skeptic will say, it was never God's will for Abraham to live. He was prospering, he was doing good. But what does Shaul say after ch chapter 10 of, uh, of Romans, of, of uh, Hebrews, in chapter 11 of Hebrews, Hebrews 11 verse 1, what does it say? But now, emunah, faith, is the substance of things for which we have trust. Or hope and faith is the conviction of things not seen. In other words, you are going to believe what you believe and you're going to continue. And even though you don't see any evidence, you're going to continue. Why? Because you have complete trust in hope in the Messiah. You know, sometimes the enemy wants to put despair. We look at our situations. I want to be despair. Look at our children, we want to have despair. Look at our circumstances, despair. We look at our financial transactions, despair. Look at our uh, health issues, despair. But you know, the opposite of despair is hope. Hope in what? Hope in God. We have to have faith and trust in God, no matter how much it looks like. E even, if, even if we feel we have made a big mistake, you know, you know what? God once we recognize what we are doing, God will turn our mistakes and turn it around for His good. And that's why Romans says that He does good for those who believe in Him. It's called divine providence. Abraham had a heart for God. 
And it looks like he made certain major dis- wrong mistakes. But that's okay. Why? Because God was in control and God was working out his will. Situations that appear to be a mistake are not a mistake. You know what? It is divine providence at work. From the physical realm, it might look like Abraham made a fatal or foolish decision. But in the eyes of God, he made a great decision. And because of his decision, you and I are basically blessing. We are the progenitors of Abraham and because of what Abraham did. Amen. Amen. Quickly as I conclude, another story in this portion talks about uh, Lot. It looks like bringing Lot on this journey was a very, very big mistake. Abraham's nephew, he's, he's, he's keeping on messing up all the time. And why did he even bring him? The Torah tells us that when Hashem revealed to Abraham that he was going to barbecue Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham, the man of God, basically, that's what happened. It was barbecue Sodom and Gomorrah. (laughs) Abraham being a man of God, he's interceding for the cities. And he's asking God, Lord, please don't destroy these cities. God said, if there is 50, if there is 40, if there is 30, if there is 10 souls, they are worthy of salvation. Therefore, but but they were not there. It's going to go. But in this whole prayer, we don't even hear that Abraham asking about Lot. The sages say, yes, while Abraham did intercede at times on behalf of his nephew Lot, because the incident of dispute between Lot, Abraham gave him over to God. Why? Because he said, it's up now up to, it's up to Lord to decide if he wants to believe in God. And that's why the Bible does not mention that he was interceding. But, but the amazing part is that it says that he went uh, in Genesis 13, 11, it says that Lord journeyed to the east. The word in Hebrew does not mean that he literally went to the east. It's basically a reference that he went away from God. He went away from God. He goes to Sodom and Gomorrah. And over there in Sodom and Gomorrah, in his difficult time, there he comes to his senses. He felt that he made a mistake. And because he felt he made a mistake, the sages say, Lot repented. And that is why Lot and his children were basically rescued out of it. You know, there's a parable in Luke chapter 15. It's called the prodigal son. You know, I don't like it to call it the prodigal son. You know why? Because really the parable is not about the son. The parable is really about the father. You know why? Because the parable begins by saying, there was a man. Who is the man? The man is the father. Yes, this guy messed up. But look at the story clearly. It's called prodigal. In the old English Webster Dictionary, Prodigal means one who is overly excessive. So the question I want to ask us is, who is overly excessive? Is it the father or is it the son? It's the father. He was excessive in love. He was excessive in mercy. He was excessive in compassion. He was excessive in running. He was excessive in clothing. He was excessive in restoration. He was excessive in everything. The son comes home. I want to be a servant. Daddy said, no, I'm making you my son. The son comes home like an evil rich man. Daddy said, that's okay. You have come. It's time to celebrate. Friends, we might have made mistakes. But if we repent, like Lot repented, like Abraham repented, God will work out things for our benefit. He will turn things around. Abraham had to overcome the evil within him. And the minute he overcame the evil within him, he was able to see God. And because he was able to see God, here Abraham is a new creation. He's believing God. Even to the point that even even if he had to overcome the physicality, he had to overcome the enemy in the spiritual. This, This evening, I have an encouragement for everybody. Maybe you're going through a difficult time. Look at the life of Abraham. Look at the life of Lot. It all seems like a big mistake. But God is able to restore. The prodigal son messed up. But the Bible says every day 
the father was watching everything. He was waiting at a distance. He was seeking after everybody. Did you see my son? Did you see my son? Did you see my son? He was praying. He was interceding. And with hope, my son will return. My son will return. My son will return. This evening, Hashem says, I will turn your mourning into dancing. Amen. Have faith. Have hope. It is a season of restoration. It is a season of turning back. Very soon you will rejoice. Just like the father in Luke chapter 15 had a celebration. God is saying very soon the synagogue will have a season of celebration. Those things which you thought are lost. Those things which you thought has no hope. Even, even Abraham gave up on his nephew Lord. But God had his eye on Lord. And through Lord comes the genealogy of Messiah Yeshua. It is Lord, it is Ruth and Naamah all connected and it is how the Messiah comes. In other words, we don't see it, but in our difficult times, God is rising up the Messiah within us. He declares the end from the beginning. And I believe in the season, this is the season of restoration. God is saying, do not give up, do not lose hope, but Khadima. Can everybody say Khadima? Kadima in Messiah. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's just stand. Father, we want to thank you, O Lord, for this season. We want to thank you, O Lord, for this evening. We want to thank you, Lord, because you are a God of restoration, O God. Lord, I pray for each and every brother. I pray for every sister over here, O God, who's going through a trial, who's going through a difficulty, who's going through a tribulation. I want to thank you that even through these trials and tribulations, O God, it is divine providence, O God. You are showing your mercy. You are showing your grace, O God. And I pray, O God, that you will turn our mourning into dancing oh God just like Abraham hoped in God just like Lot hoped in God just like all the men and women of the Bible hoped in God oh Father Lord the Bible very clearly says that faith is a subset of things not seen I pray that hope will arise Hope will arise and every kind of negative thing and every kind of thing which the enemy has put to cause despair upon the lives of the people. I command it in the name of Yeshua to be burned and I speak freedom. Amen. Hallelujah. Be free, be restored and have hope. Have hope. We are in a season of restoration.